In this tutorial, we're going to talk about the way that the pointing vector changes when you're in a dielectric that has a complex refractive index. Let's review. We already have derived what the pointing vector, the power per unit area in a beam, looks like when we're just in air. And it has this form. We have that the we have an energy density, one half epsilon naught E naught squared, and that's traveling at a speed C naught. And it's going in some direction, which here I've chosen the z direction. And remember, this is a specific form for the pointing vector that corresponds to a plane wave. And the plane wave electric field is given by some constant vector, e naught, and then this typical time and space dependence, e to the i kz minus omega t. Now, we have discussed in a dielectric that we have epsilon naught in air goes towards being epsilon naught n squared in terms of the mathematics, the Maxwell equations transform such that everywhere you see an epsilon naught, you now put an epsilon naught n squared. And everywhere that you see a c naught, this one we're pretty familiar with, you would replace it with a c naught over n. So this would lead to the expectation that the pointing vector in a dielectric would be like this. Would be the pointing vector in sub d for a dielectric. Well, we would expect that the c naught would become c naught over n and then times one half epsilon naught, and then we would get a factor of n squared there, and then everything else would stay the same. So that would be our expectation. It's not going to turn out exactly that way, but we would sort of expect that the speed of the energy pack of the energy density would be reduced. We would expect that maybe the energy density changes because the wave fronts get closer together when you go into a glass, the wavelength gets smaller. And we would certainly expect it to travel in the same direction. But one thing we're missing here, we have no attenuation. And we know that the, a complex refractive index, n, means that the wave doesn't propagate with unchanged amplitude as it propagates if it has an imaginary component to its k vector, which is equivalent to saying that n has an imaginary component, we expect some decay. So where's the decay in the pointing vector? Well, if we follow the actual math through, we'll find that. So let's go ahead and do that. So if we, if we go back to the derivation of the pointing vector, and I'll write it this way, 1 half epsilon naught c naught squared. That's instead of writing a mu naught in the denominator, by the way. We've often seen this as 1 over 2 mu naught. Here I'll write 1 half epsilon naught c naught squared times the real of the cross product between E and the complex conjugate of B. And we've already worked out the math for this before in a previous tutorial, but I'll follow a couple of steps through here. We'll remember that because these are plane waves, we know that the magnetic field is related to the electric field through the fundamental Maxwell equations by this particular relationship, k cross c over omega. That comes from the curl of E Maxwell equation. We also know that B is perpendicular to k and perpendicular to E. There's this triple orthogonality. We're going to use the fact that k and E are orthogonal in a little while. And for this particular plane wave, let's just be precise that k the k vector is equal to some k magnitude times the z hat direction. No loss of generality, we just have to choose some direction. Makes the math a little bit simpler. If we just look at the next line of this expression, and we substitute in for b co complex conjugate, we still have this 1 half epsilon naught c naught squared out there. And we get that triple cross product, e cross 
k star k complex conjugate cross e complex conjugate over omega. And we have another thing that we remember, which is that which is the triple cross product. I'll just make that appear here. So there's our triple cross product back of the cab. So when we write out one more line of this expression, we will get the following. K star plays the role of B. And I'll take the omega with that. So there's my back term, and this is the one that we're familiar with seeing, where we end up finding that the intensity in the beam is proportional to E dot E star. And then we do have another term, but this one is going to go to zero. Let's just see that. It's going to be E star. It's going to be E star multiplied with the dot product of E and K star. Now we start killing some things. E and K are vectors that are orthogonal to each other. The complex conjugate of K does not change the fact that it's in the z hat direction and therefore orthogonal to E. So the first thing we can do is to say that this term has gone to zero. And now we're left just analyzing the E dot E star term. So one more time, get this in front. So we'll write this as K star is K scalar quantity star times z hat. The omega I'm going to keep with the k because we'll combine those later. So e dot e star, well here's e and we'll notice a few things here that I won't bother writing down. When I multiply e times its complex conjugate, the e to the minus i omega t from this will be canceled by an e to the plus i omega t in the complex conjugate. So that's going to go away. The electric field vector, it's dotted into its complex conjugate. Like it could be circularly polarized light, x hat plus i y hat dotted into its complex conjugate. But what's new here is e to the i k z, because k is complex. So let's be very explicit about what that's going to be. It's going to be e to the i k z times e to the i k complex conjugate z. The k won't quite kill itself when it's complex conjugated because we're going to have k and k star which is not equal to k. Let's, sub let's go one more line with this. One half e dot its complex conjugate will bring out e not dot e not complex conjugate. What's this? Now what's left in here? We still got complex conjugate of k over omega and then we've got e to the i k z times e to the i k complex conjugate z. And I made, a mis I made a little omission here. This should be a minus sign. So when I look at these two terms, these are going to become e to the i k minus its complex conjugate, both times z. And then this z hat is the direction of the pointing vector, and I'll leave it on the outside. I look at k minus its complex conjugate. Well, if we write k equals k real plus i times k imaginary, if we think of it that way, then k minus its own complex conjugate is 2i times k imaginary. So notice the real part of the wave vector has canceled out as it would have if we were just in air. Now that we're in a dielectric though, there's this imaginary part that survives. And that of course is going to give us our attenuation. You can almost see that coming.
you're gonna have an I times an I but let's let's actually work it out now we can pull everything out now and we've got one half epsilon naught C naught squared the amplitude of the overall electric field squared written formally this way this e to the i times this 2i ki, that's going to be e to the something real. We can just pull that right out. e to the minus 2kiz. That's a totally real quantity, so it comes outside of the real. The only thing left that we're taking the real of is complex is k complex conjugate over omega. Well, the complex conjugate of k is kr minus i ki. When I take the real of that, the imaginary part goes away, and I just am left with k real. So the real of this expression is k real over omega. And then we have, at the end, a z hat. So we've now got our final expression. And now that we've gotten this far, let's actually erase a lot of our work that came above and compare this expression directly to this guy up here. So now that we've cleaned it up, we can compare our expectation with our derivation. And you can see they're certainly looking very similar to each other. Let's just take this kr over omega. We'll notice that if you work it out, k real over omega equals the real part of the refractive index over the speed of light. So in general, omega over k equals c naught over n. Omega over k real is c naught over n real. So if we write n real over c naught there, you'll notice we can start putting this very much in this form. Let's take the c naught squared. One factor of c naught goes away from this. We're left with a c naught. Then let's do the energy density term. We've got one half epsilon naught. Now we can take that n real and put it here and then write the, the electric field dot product. So this becomes our energy density term. And then we've got this new term for exponential decay. And lastly, we've got our direction. This looks even more like this expression up here. But notice, we really expected from the way that the Maxwell equations transform that epsilon naught would pick up an n squared and c naught would get an n in its denominator. But I notice I can get exactly that factor if I just divide c naught by n real and multiply n real times another factor of n real. That doesn't change anything. It's just multiplying n real once in the numerator, once in the denominator. So then I can get my expression to look almost exactly like what I wanted it to. I have c naught over n real times an energy density term. And now, indeed, I do pick up that epsilon naught gets multiplied by a refractive index squared. And then this square of the electric field constant vector. And then bring down this exponential decay factor and have the whole thing going in the pointing vector direction. So now we've got it, this expression here. I like to write it this way so that I can say that just as in air, where we have light going, we have energy going at speed, the speed we expect plane waves to be traveling, the energy density we expect plane waves to have, and the z-hat direction, now we again have, we have a reduced speed Notice, though, we have an increased energy density, and 
we have attenuation. This expression now looks essentially exactly like this expression up here. And if I had been more strict up here, I actually would have written E naught squared exactly this way. This is more technically correct in case it's not linearly polarized light. If you have x and y components out of phase. So this is the modified pointing vector expression. This will now be true anywhere. It's true in air as well as being true in any material with any complex refractive index n.